word together and to pray together, and it certainly is a privilege. And you guys made a choice to get up this morning and to come here, and we're thankful the Lord put on your hearts to be a part of this, whether this is your church home or uh, you're just visiting, we're thankful you're here. By the way, if you are visiting with us, we consider it a privilege to have you here. If you would like somebody on our leadership team to connect with you on the offering box back there, there are welcome cards. You can fill that out, make the request, and we'll follow up with you. If you have prayer requests, we have several different groups uh, in our fellowship who devote themselves to a time of prayer on a weekly basis. If you have prayer requests, you can fill one of those out as well and put it in there, and I'll make sure that uh, those who are part of those prayer ministries receive those and are lifting up those requests, okay? So we're certainly glad you guys are here again today. It's not everybody's out of the loop with, uh, with illnesses. Boy, I'll tell you what, the colds and the flus are really starting to kick in. We know we've got a lot of people out of the loop today, so let's pray for each other. We will during our prayer time, certainly. And again, hey, good morning to everybody up there in the upper room. Good to see all you guys. Things going well? Yeah, for the most part, huh? <laughs> there's, there's a hand sticking up over there. Okay, okay you guys, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord. Let's open in a word of prayer. And let's, uh, then we'll continue by just seeking his face in a time of worship. Well, Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you. God, we thank you for your love, your faithfulness, God, your grace and mercy and the privilege that we have to be able to come and spend time before your throne of grace. Just to worship you, just to be with you, God. It's such, certainly an amazing gift and an honor that you give us. Help us to never take it for granted or take it lightly. Father, I thank you that you know every heart that's here this morning. Father, from the youngest child next door in the nursery and all those precious kids and the preschool and the CKC next door, Lord, just meet them where they're at with your Holy Spirit. Just touch their hearts and lives through your word and your presence. Father, we pray for those who are teaching our children next door, God, that you would just be with them as well. Bless them for their willingness to say, here I am, Lord, use me. God, fill them with your Holy Spirit and use them that as they share your word, may they be your heart and your hands and your feet to our kids, Lord. And, Father, we thank you for all who are here in the worship center. Again, you know each of our hearts, Lord. You know where we're at in our relationship with you, Lord. And you know if there's anyone here today that doesn't have an abiding and authentic relationship with you, God. And that's what life is all about, that we would know you, know that we have eternal life. And, Lord, that we would love you and follow you, that we would love our families, that we would love the people we share life with. And, Lord, that we would love a hurting and dying world that needs to know you. So we just thank you, Lord. Again, you're here to meet us. You know the hearts that are heavy. God, the hearts that are discouraged, that need encouragement. Lord, you know the hearts that need uh, correction. Lord, you know everything about our lives. So we just ask that you would come and have your way today, God. Keep us safe from the enemy. Father, keep us safe from the schemes and strategies that he might try to employ to keep us distracted. Lord, help us to stay focused on you. Keep us safe from this fallen world that we live in. And, uh, Father, please keep us safe from ourselves. I know sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. So help us to walk in the spirit. And may today be an opportunity that our focus is totally on you. So come now, Lord. Come now and have your way. Meet us here in Holy Spirit, as Jesus said, you are the teacher that leads into all truth. So come, lead us now as we seek your face, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can stand if you'd like or remain seated. The main thing always, right, is the attitude of our hearts. We would worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Let's just seek his face.
fall on your grace Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you, lifted on your wings And the world will see that our God Lord, in your name, morning turns and morning turns to songs of praise. And our God saves, yes, our God saves, seeds bow down as your people sing we will rise with you did on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see that our God said Lord, in your name, morning turns and morning turns, songs of praise, and our God says, yes, our God says, sing it again, church, our God. you came to seek and to save the lost and we can never thank you enough that you came to redeem us God this morning we're just overwhelmed by your presence and by your love Lord Galaxy spinning a heaven 
There is no one more beautiful. You are beautiful. God, you are the most beautiful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Oh, God, there is no one more wonderful. You are wonderful. God, you are the most wonderful. together in adoration and worship, Lord. I praise you. I were amazed by you, Lord. Grand to earth has quaked before sound of his voice sees that I shaken and stood can be calmed and broken for my regard through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is with through it all, through it all, Lord, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Yes, Lord. Far be it from me to not be. This mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, Lord, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Yes, Lord. See a church through it all. Through it all. Through it all. My eyes are on you. Through it all. Through it all. It is well. So let go, my soul. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. Sing a church. So let. And trust in Him, the waves and wind 
fixed on you, Jesus. God, we can navigate any challenge, any storm that's part of our experience, this side of eternity, Lord. And we're just so thankful again for your faithfulness, God, for your provision, that you empower us through and by your Holy Spirit, that as you told Paul the Apostle, that your grace, God, is sufficient. Lord, it's all that we need. Lord, you give us the resources in and through and from you, Lord, for us to live this life, to glorify and and Jesus, again, we're so thankful that this morning as we're gathered here, that you're here with us. Again, meeting each heart right where we're at. Help us to be open to you, Lord, and just to hear from you what your word would speak to our hearts. And Fathers, we just go through a little time of devotion, continued prayer before your throne. God, help us stay in this worshipful state before you, God. Just be with Glenn as he shares and leads in this time. That his prayers, Lord, would be according to your will, nothing more, nothing less. And Lord, we just thank you again for the privilege and honor of just spending this time before you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated for prayer time. This morning, we're not going to do a devotion. 
We're going to spend a little time in prayer. So as I'm praying, just close your eyes. And, and when God's speaking to you, if there's someone out there you need to pray for, pray for them. I was up at 3.30 this morning. I don't know if it's a time change or what. But I took a little time to pray. Because God wakes us up when, we, when someone needs prayer. As we see the darkness here and we think it's nighttime here, it's, it's light somewhere else. Is there a Christian out there that needed prayer? Or was it one of our brothers and sisters here that needed prayer? So just pray. God knows who it is. Just open your heart and just pray. So let's pray. Lord, we just want to come before you and humble ourselves. You are a good, good father, and we just want to praise you and thank you for that. We want to thank you for another day here so that we can go out and do what you need us to do. And, Lord, I do want to lift up anyone this morning that I prayed for, that whoever it is, God, that you're watching out over and protecting them. That I got news this morning from Pastor Phil that Rodney's father had passed away with cancer. So I want to lift up Rodney and his family as they're traveling, as they go through this time of grieving. We just lift them up to you, Lord. It's your plan, not ours. It's your will and not ours. So we just give that to you, God. I want to pray for anyone here in this congregation who may be going through trials or tribulations. As Pastor Phil was last week reading in the book of Matthew, that we may be in that little boat getting swamped by the waves and we got our little teaspoon trying to get the water out Lord let us throw our teaspoons down and walk on the water over to you take your hand and ask you to guide us so we lift it up to you Lord Lord I want to pray for the OCC the Operation Christmas Child those boxes that go out to all over the world for the little kids and their parents in your word going out, Lord, what an awesome thing it is that we can be a part of that. So we lift that up to you, Lord. I also want to lift up the teachers here, the ones that are in the back and the ones that will be teaching after prayer and devotion. Lord, be with them. Let your words be their words. Let them share and, and whatever they're doing, God, we just give all praise and glory to you for that. Lord, I want to pray for Israel and lift them up to you. They are your people, and we just want to pray pray for them, Lord. Lord, I also want to pray for our government. From Washington, D.C., Salt Lake City to Vernal, Utah, Lord, that they, they lead for your will, not theirs, that they open up to see how you want them to lead. And I pray for this country, Lord, that all of the division and everything going on, God, that we as Christians can just throw it away, knowing that our citizenship is first and foremost is, is with you in heaven, and that's where we'll be for eternity. So, Lord, I just pray that uh, people will come to know you and will come to see you. I want to pray for Pastor Phil this morning as he comes to teach. Lord, be with him. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Let us see what he, you're trying to tell us, Lord. Because there's always somewhere in there and when Pastor Phil's teaching that we all take something home with us that hits with all of us. So, Lord, we lift it all up to you. Lord, we just want to give this time to you. We want to praise you and thank you for everything. And we lift all these prayers up to you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, appreciate Glenn's availability. Uh, he kind of stepped in the last minute to do our prayer time this morning. We don't have one elder here today. Uh, just circumstances. One of them's traveling back from Oklahoma. One worked all night last night. One's ill. And as you prayed for Rodney Engelholm, I got word last night at 10 o'clock that his father, who's been battling cancer, passed away in Texas. So uh, Rodney and his family are preparing to go to Texas for that. And thankfully, 
Uh, Rodney's father, just in the last few years, came to know Jesus, came to enter into a saving relationship with him. And thank the Lord, right, that at the moment he drew his last breath, based on God's grace and his love and his mercy and that provision of eternal life, that uh, his experience now is beyond our comprehension. To be absent from the body, as Paul said, to be present with the Lord when we know him. And so, you know, we're so thankful for that, but, uh, you know, hearts are heavy and for Rodney and his loved ones, his wife and son and uh, everybody in Texas. They'll be making a trip down later this week to Texas, so keep those guys lifted up, right? And uh, be praying for each other. Again, a lot of people suffering from colds and flus, illnesses. Uh, spiritual warfare has been high for some time, and we've discussed that. And uh, today, if, as a matter of fact, as we continue in our study in Matthew 8 here in a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll address some of that because we'll see in our text today about Jesus dealing with a couple of guys who are uh, basically, literally possessed with demonic spirits. And that's an interesting and unique circumstance, but we see how Jesus deals with that. Before we get into that, and before we dismiss our fourth and fifth grade in middle school and junior high, quick announcements, of course. Uh, coming up soon, uh, in fact, I believe on the 12th, the 12th to the 19th, is the collection week for Operation Christmas Child. And so you see all the elements that are out here. We've had a few people start to bring their boxes back in. Liz Smith, who is directing our ministry this year, happens to be out uh, with illness this morning, her and her daughter as well. And so, again, pray for them. But we're going to show a, a clip from OCC, and we've been doing that. Again, what an amazing ministry to be involved in, and we've done this for 15 years, and of course, the, the fellowship here, we're the local collection site. The goal this year, hopefully, is about 850 boxes. In a depressed economy, it's gone down a little bit, but there's been years in the past uh, with a thoughtfulness and generosity in this community that we've had over 1,000 boxes. I think the high at one point was 1,200. So we were able to take out to Calvary, Salt Lake, where that's the local Intermountain uh, Collection Center. So. Uh, Nate, go ahead and show that video real quick again. Did you pack your boxes? Yes. Yes. Can you say that? Yes. You say we packed your boxes? Yes. <laughs> you get a boy or a girl, and you get a toys, okay? And you put them in neatly. <laughs> Guys. Don't fight. We pack them full of stuff that people don't have to the kids that have nothing. Because they don't have anything, and they don't have anything, they don't have nothing to play with. Are these from you, Aiden? Guys. A baby doll. Okay, but first put the baby. Puppies, toothbrushes, dinosaurs. <laughs> With those socks, towel, wagon, are you listening? <laughs> what? Do you put school supplies in there too so kids can go to school? No. No. I think that she was going to go to Africa. <laughs> um, South America, Asia, and <laughs> to the beach. To the beach? Yes. One, two, three, so. Try to come again. One, two, three, so, side. That's right. Um, kids have to learn about Jesus because he loves us and he loves all the kids. We pray for them so they will know Jesus. When he got born, he looked very cute. The God I heard these shoeboxes get to the boys and girls. God, God, I hope they like them. God, I hope the children like them. God. And we pray for the shoeboxes to get to the people and, and the over the planet. Amen. Amen. That's good stuff. <laughs> Kids are always awesome, right? They always uh, bring such a, an awesome element. So, by the way, that just reminds me of something we, we try to enforce here and reinforce consistently. But like Jesus said, unless we have the faith of a child, right? And that only it relates to salvation, simplicity that's in Christ. 
But one of the wisest things we can do as we're going in grace and knowledge in our relationship with God is to always be in a place of childlike, not childish, childlike faith and trust and simple dependence upon him. And it's amazing how he responds to that as we trust him and as we seek him. And those little kids, again, are, a, are an amazing example of that, just their prayers, right, as they're seeking the Lord, praying for all these other little kids. And doesn't it blow you away to know that millions of little kids are going to receive these shoe boxes in third world countries who may never have received gifts before. And uh, you've seen those videos. We showed them to you before, the villages and all those kids just smiles on our faces. They're so excited and happy. And, and that's a wonderful thing. But the most important thing, again, is they hear a clear presentation of the gospel. They share the gospel with them. And then they have a discipleship program that helps those kids be grounded and rooted and have a solid knowledge of the Lord and what it is to walk with him. And so you can imagine the impact within their families and everywhere else. So it's an amazing thing. How many of you guys would like to go on a trip someday and be part of a distribution in a third world country? That'd be, that'd be awesome, right? You know, who knows? Maybe someday we could be a part of that. That would be an awesome thing. Uh, back here on the table, you'll see there are, are various resources. This particular handout shows the amazing journey of a simple shoebox begins with us, right? Being willing to be the heart, hands, and feet of Jesus with these practical gifts. And you can actually go online and you can log in your gifts and track where they go, which is really cool. Then on the opposite side of that, it shows how to pack a shoebox gift. So keep that in mind. So that's really important. And then also choosing a child, whether it's a boy or a girl and their age range, you can get some of these brochures over there. It gives you the information on how to do it. And then also to put that label on each of the boxes. And then also prayer, right? Prayer is absolutely critical. You know, we always hear again, people say the power of prayer. No, the reminder is it's not the power of the prayer. It's the power of God in response to the prayer. He's the power. So get one of these uh, bookmarks, and you can see that Sunday through Saturday, there are various things to be praying about as it relates to this ministry and those involved, and certainly these kids. So uh, grab those resources up here, and you know in the next couple of weeks, obviously, things are going to start flooding in here. We'll probably have, by the time they're being taken out to Salt Lake, 30 to 40 of those big cartons packed with these boxes. So it's going to get pretty exciting around here, and be praying. Really be praying for the little kids who will receive that. Other stuff that's upcoming, um, Christmas program. It's that time, right? Here we are. We're in November. It's just crazy. What, Thanksgiving's two weeks from Thursday, right? Wow. That's, wow. <laughs> what more can you say, huh? So we are having, of course, our annual Christmas program, and Amy McCright is directing that this year, so uh, we appreciate that. We have uh, a couple of volunteers who signed up to help. I know on the Facebook page, several have expressed interest in being involved as well, but we would really like to have you sign up on the sheet in the entry right there on the bulletin board. If you can serve and be a part of assisting, that would be great. But also, if you would like to be in the program, you can be four years old up through 16. So it's going to be quite a diverse group that's part of that. So back there, and we've got the materials for the program arriving tomorrow. So expect to see information going out for preparation and uh, planning soon, okay, and practice as well. Also, some other wonderful things that we've got going on. Uh, the women's ministry, if you know, my wife Chris oversees that ministry and teaches a Thursday night study at our house. Of course, we've got seven Calvary Connection small groups. There were three that are in a fellowship home setting. So she teaches the uh, one on women's study on Thursday nights, but she wanted me to mention to you that they're planning on having a holiday party Okay, on December the 1st at our house at 6 o'clock. That's a Saturday, so I'm going to have to find somewhere else to go. I'm guessing on, <laughs> on the, probably some, my brother's house to watch football. I don't know. That's probably going to be the case. So, ladies, there's some smaller versions of this with the information on that, and it's going to be like a sock exchange. going to be a great time of fellowship. December the 1st at 6 p.m. That's on a Saturday night for this, but the women's study is ongoing on Thursday nights. Of course, there's a home fellowship study at 6.30 at Bob and Kim Barton's house. Right now, they're doing a study called A Life God Rewards, so it's on the Bama seat, the judgment seat of Christ, eternal perspective. Wednesday nights, we're back on track with our youth group. Of course, this last Wednesday, we had an alternative, a Halloween alternative, and we had a great fellowship time with our youth groups and adults. The place was packed, and we had a great time of fellowship. Watched Tim Hawkins. The kids played games. And uh, all of all those who provided and served and helped with our kids, we really appreciate you guys. So this Wednesday, we're back on track. 6.30, we have worship service. We spend time before the Lord and singing his praise, right, some prayer time. 7 o'clock, middle school and junior high, high school, they go next door to their area. And then I'm teaching a study in the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights, so we're here. If we've got 30 or less, we go into the upper room 
room there in the coffee house. And uh, if we got a bigger group than that, we just stay down here. But it's been a wonderful study. We're in Revelation chapter 8 right now. So wonderful opportunities. Men, 6 o'clock, Friday mornings in the upper room up there as well. And by the way, this week, it's the second week. So it's this, because it's the second week, it won't be on Friday. Guys, it's going to be on Saturday. We'll have a breakfast at 8 o'clock, and we'll continue our study in the book of Micah. And it's called A Life Well Lived based on that. So again, wonderful opportunities for people just to connect and to fellowship and to learn and to grow. That's good stuff. And then one last thing my wife mentioned here, children's ministry training tonight. For those who are serving nursery through uh, third grade, so that would be nursery, preschool, CKC, of course, there's a bunch of them over there right now. You could hear the worship going on, couldn't you, when we were doing worship? So never forget, all these little kids are next door. If you're serving in that, 6 o'clock here tonight, you need to be here. Next Sunday at 5.30, for those who serve in the older groups, middle school, junior high, fourth and fifth grade, uh, it's at 5.30. It's, it's a shorter training because you've all read uh, the Ordinary Servant book. You've gone through the questionnaires and done all that stuff. So there will be a, a short teaching at 5.30 next week. And then at 6 o'clock, if you serve, in any capacity, in the life of our fellowship, you're considered leadership. And so if you influence, you lead. We have a leadership koinonia next Sunday night at 6 o'clock here in the fellowship. And uh, we need you to be here if you serve because we're going to get together for a time of fellowship and, then, of course, a time of concentrated prayer, just going before the Lord and seeking his face on behalf of this fellowship and whatever he puts on our hearts to pray about. So wonderful opportunities coming up. As it relates to the Christmas program, we don't know the exact date yet. We've got to connect with World Vision Assembly and arrange for the use of their facility. And for years, they've been so thoughtful to let us use their worship center and then their fellowship area for our Christmas dinner and our play. And someday, our new building... You know, it's going to get finished. We're two-thirds of the way there. And quickly about that, folks, we had a gift that just came in this last week, $4,500. As you know, we don't do any formal fundraising. You never have. You, don't, you know that we don't even pass basket here on a Sunday morning. We trust the Lord to stir the hearts of his people in faithfulness, and God does that. We follow the example in the tabernacle in Exodus 25 through 35 that God would stir the hearts of the willing, and he certainly does that. So with that, God has provide, provided over $1.6 million on that project and not one fundraiser. Praise God for that, right? That's awesome. And you know, we're, uh, even though we're one of 15 Calvaries in the state, we get Calvaries across the world and a lot of Christian churches, we're autonomous. That means that, you know, when God does something in our church, there's not a big group that comes around and there's not this general fund that's provided for this. It's just our church and what God does. Now, we've had some thoughtfulness. You guys know the Calvary Chapel St. George in May sent us a gift of 23000 towards the project, which was a real blessing. So, you know, we're getting close to jumping into the electrical phase. We had a meeting on Friday with our architect, and so things are getting closer for the electrical phase to kick off. So continue to pray about that, and we'll keep you guys up to speed as things develop. And again, someday we'll be able to be in that uh, new building and not have to use World Vision anymore. So we're thankful we got a place together, right? It's not where you're at, it's why you're gathered. We're gathered to seek the Lord, and we're thankful we've got a place, a roof overhead, we can seek the Lord together. So with that, let's dismiss fourth and fifth grade, middle school, and middle school, right? There's no such thing as junior high in Vernal anymore, right? There's two middle schools. So if you're in middle school, then you guys are free to go as well. Man, you know what? There's usually this mass exodus and stream of guys coming out of the upper room up there. Not as many today. We do have quite a few people out of the loop, so. And with that, just real quickly, guys, you know that we have not gone back to two services yet, okay? So was there coming down? Let me share this with you. Uh, we, we went to one service back in June as opposed to the two services because we'd lost over 25 families to relocations with the down economy, and it just didn't make sense to do two services at that point in time. So as we trend back into the fall and people have been out of the loop, re-engage, then chances are at some time in the not-too-distant future we're going to have to go back to a 9 and 11. The 11 o'clock service, of course, is when we have children's ministry. But just so that you know, at the end of November and the end of December, we are going to have a 9 and 11, and they're going to be family services. That means we will not have any children's ministry next door. The end of this month, the last Sunday of this month and December, we're going to have the kids in with us for both of those services so we can have family services. And really the reason for that is in our children's ministry teams, we've gotten so used, we've been so blessed to having over 40 people staff our children's ministry. And so there were four teams rotating, so one Sunday a month, right? 
Well, this time around, because of the loss of so many people uh, with relocations and all, we're down to three teams per, per group. And so uh, instead of trying to get them being a place where they're rotating around and, and serving more than they need to be, what we're going to do for now, the end of November, December, is just on that fourth Sunday is just have families in here together. So keep that in mind because if everybody comes with all the kids at 11, at the 10, at 11 o'clock, then we're, we're not going to have any room, right? We were almost standing room last week. So keep that in mind that the last of the month that uh, you might want to come at 9 o'clock and bring your kids to that one so we can spread it out a little bit, okay? All right, we appreciate you guys. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to continue our verse-by-verse study in the Gospel of Matthew. And while you're turning to Matthew chapter 8, and we'll conclude this chapter today, we study the Bible verse by verse because we want to see the context of the historical accounts and events that were occurring back in this time, in this particular time frame. Of course, this is Jesus' earthly ministry. And uh, Matthew, by the way, when you think of the Gospels, right, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are called the synoptic Gospels. Have you heard that term before? And it, what it means is together seeing, uh, optic seeing, right? Synergy, syn, synoptic means together seeing. So the first three are called synoptic gospels because together they see the ministry and the life of Jesus in unique perspectives, but they see it all together. So that's why you have, when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three unique perspectives. And the Holy Spirit inspired that way because Matthew was written to appeal to a Jewish culture and a Jewish mindset and to communicate to them that Jesus is Yeshua, that he is their Messiah, the Mashiach, okay? So there's a lot of Jewishness to that, and you see that when you go through that. So keep that in mind as we're going through this today. And we worked our way up towards the end of Matthew chapter 8, and today we're going to read verses 28 through 34, and that will conclude the chapter. Then we'll uh, add a little bit more today as it relates to the aspect and the issue of spiritual warfare. I mentioned that a little bit before we began today. So let's read the passages first. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, and we're going to pray after we read these passages, and then we're going to open them up and study them. So we find this, Matthew chapter 8, beginning of verse 28, that when he, that's Cap, so that's Jesus, when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gerasenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him saying, If you cast us out, permit us that to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, again, as we undertake uh, this time in your word, just studying, God, we want to learn and grow. We thank you that your word itself declares that it's living and powerful. God, you inspired the living word of God, and it transforms our hearts and our lives, our thinking, Lord, and we pray that we would have the mind of Christ this morning. Lord, as we study the particular passages out we're going to study today, Lord, you know every heart that's here, you know what we need, and it's amazing how you meet us right where we're at. Father, we pray that as we study these historical accounts again, that, that we're aware of that. We remember, Lord, that these things actually happened. But there's practical application in our lives today, Lord, that means something for us today. So may that be the application that you bring forth through your Holy Spirit. So we just entrust this time into your hands as we just have this adventure and journey in your word. And we pray this all, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, before we jump into this unique section of the word, now remember, we've already seen in chapter 8, some amazing stuff. The beginning passages in John, or Matthew chapter 8 are Jesus healing, member various people. He meets that leper who was in a state. Again, if we would have seen him physically, we'd have been like, wow, right? And Jesus miraculously reaches out to this man. By the way, it says that this leper came and he worshiped Jesus. Jesus did not reject that. Why? Because he is Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And he reached out and he touched this man and he healed him. It was a miraculous thing. And you know what? Again, we're all... 
until we come to know Jesus and we're touched by him for salvation, we suffer from the spiritual disease of leprosy because we're dead. We're dead people walking in our sin, our trespass, until we know Jesus. So there's an amazing metaphor there as well. He healed the centurion servant. We saw that expression of faith by a Gentile man, and Jesus honored that, and at his word, his servant was healed at a distance. We saw how he healed Peter's mother-in-law, right? So uh, he loved Peter's mother-in-law. Peter must have loved his mother-in-law as well, right? We, we kind of went over that a little bit. Some guys don't love their mother-in-law so good, but I do. She's not here today, but... <laughs> I'm blessed. And also then Jesus went on to heal many who came to him, that were brought to him. By the way, remember, this all authenticates and speaks to the reality that Jesus Christ is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Mashiach, the Messiah. And the Messiah would heal, that he would open the eyes of the blind born from birth. He would open the ears of the deaf from birth. Only Messiah could do that. He would raise the dead to life. And what we see is this amazing reality in his ministry uh, around the Sea of Galilee, remember, around Capernaum, Capernaum, I showed you guys the pictures from some, some of our trips there of the Sea of Galilee, the area where Jesus taught the, the Beatitudes, what's believed to be that, and then the remnants of the village of Capernaum, and her Peter lived there, Matthew lived there, and we know the fishermen, some of those guys that lived there as well, and then Jesus based his ministry there. So all these events were happening in that region. And last week, we saw this reality about Jesus calling those who wanted to follow him to count the cost of discipleship, the priority of living for him and following him, that he needed to be first. And then we saw that amazing reality that Jesus said, okay, guys, let's jump in the boat. So they jump in the boat, right? And Jesus says, uh, man, he's tired. He's been pouring himself out in ministry to these people, and he didn't turn anyone away. And so as they get in the boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, he's asleep in the back of the boat. And remember, we looked at this amazing storm that arose. And these guys are freaking out, right? A lot of them are fishermen who had spent their entire life fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Certainly they had seen some storms before, right? And I shared with you guys last week that even to this day, because of the, the, where it's laid out, where the Sea of Galilee is, and how sometimes the, the cool winds can come down the canyons there and, and hit the warm air, that storms can come up out of the blue that even to today, they can have white caps and they can have uh, waves that are as high as 15 feet or more. So when this happened, these guys are freaking out because this wasn't any ordinary storm. And they wondered, did Jesus even care? Remember, he's asleep in the boat. The, the, the storm didn't wake him up. Remember that? They had to go wake him up. So I want to remind you guys of something very powerful. I want you to go with me to verse 25. And we'll segue into our portion that we're looking at today. But it says this, that then his disciples came to him, he's in the back of the boat of sleeping, and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. So that was a practical reality, right? Okay, we're, we're going down, we're going to drown, we're going to die, please save us. But here's the reality, the big picture is that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost spiritually, right? And don't you love that? So he meets these guys as need practically, in their circumstance, but he came ultimately to seek and to save the lost. But look what his response was. Again, they're the ones that woke him up, not the storm. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? You know what? We see Jesus saying that on occasions throughout the Gospels where he tells people, he asks them, why do you have such little faith? Now remember, something that you need to remember, that where there is little faith in the life of a believer, then they're usually experiencing a lot of fear. The more fear and the less faith, and the fear is going to probably be a huge influence in a person's life, and you see that. But the more faith, the less fear. And your faith grows when your focus is on the Lord and you're truly committed to a life of discipleship, truly seeking his face continually, truly spending time in his living word and with him, folks. There's no substitute for that. We can't treat Jesus like medication. And all too often, that's what a lot of people will do. You know, life's going pretty good. Okay, I'll, just, I'll go to church on occasion. I'll just, you know, I'll appease God. He'll be happy with me. And you know what? Things get rough. What do we do? We get a headache. We go to the medicine cabinet, get some Tylenol. We're going through a tough time. Oh, God, where are you? I need you. Oh, Lord. And so we treat him like medication. And here's the reality. We can't expect to have a life of peace in spite of the challenges unless there's consistent depth of relationship with him because you're really abiding with him. And that's his goal is to get us to that place. So when he says, why are you fearful, oh, you of little faith? 
He wants us all to be in a place where there's less fear because there's more faith, because our eyes are fixed on him. We sang that song today, right? That modern version of it is well. Do it all, Lord. Do it all. My eyes are on you. And that's the key. So Jesus then arose. He rebuked the winds and the sea. They were, then there was a great calm. Isn't that amazing? These guys were blown away by that. The people who had been following him around the Sea of Galilee, perhaps that there were still hundreds, maybe even thousands on the shoreline watching them in the boat. The storm comes up and they watch this miraculous reality that this raging storm that was uh, off the charts, apparently it was worse than normal, what they were used to, that even these fishermen were freaking out about it. And so all of a sudden, Jesus commands the waves and the wind, and he says, let there be calm, and there was a great calm. So the men, those who were in the boat with him, the ones who he had called to really walk with him, the inner circle, so to speak, right? So the men marveled, and what did they say? Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him, right? They've been watching him heal people, they had been watching that interaction. They'd been watching him teach, and he'd been teaching the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures, and Jesus himself fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies relating to the coming of the Messiah. But speaking of that, I want you to go with me. Let's go back to Psalm 89. I want you to track back with me right now to hundreds of years before this, and this is a messianic psalm, by the way, very powerful. In Psalm 89... We find in verses 8 and 9 something very familiar to what we're seeing here in Matthew chapter 8. So we find this, and it's up on the screen here as well. It says in verse 8 of Psalm 89, O Lord God, you notice it's all caps on Lord. Remember that's Yahweh, Yahovah. Some people say Jehovah, right? But uh, there's no J's in the Hebrew, so it's a Yah. It's a Yah sound, so it's Yahweh or Yahovah. So O Yahweh, Elohim, God, Generic term for supreme deity, O Lord God, O Yahweh Elohim, God of hosts, Sevaot. What does it say? Who is mighty like you, O Lord? So it's a question. Who is there, Lord, that compares to you? Who is mighty like you? Your faithfulness always surrounds you. So keep that in mind, God's faithfulness. Keep God's faithfulness in mind. Look at verse 9. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Wow. What did Jesus do? What did they watch him do on the Sea of Galilee? He calmed the storm and the raging waves and the raging sea, right? And wow, if they were familiar with the Psalms, they would have been familiar with passages like this, and that had to blow their minds. Now, I want you to go back to the beginning of Psalm 89 because I want you to see God's faithfulness again, not only to meet us in the storms of life when we're seeking him and following him, but God's faithfulness to his people throughout the generations. Look what it says in verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord, all caps against which Yahweh. I will sing of the mercies of Yahweh forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. One of the greatest witnesses we can be for Jesus is sharing with people his faithfulness, his goodness to us, right? Because when you walk with him, you know that. You know that he's been faithful. Doesn't mean you're not going to have challenging seasons because we are. We do have those storms that are part of our experience. But what do we do with those things? How do we navigate? How do we handle it? If we sing of his mercies, if we praise him, if our eyes are on him, then guess what? Then it, it is well. It doesn't mean the storm's completely gone, but sometimes God allows the storms to be there for a while. If it gets us to the place of greater dependence and trust in him, right? And it says this in verse 2, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. So God stores up mercy to expand at the proper times. Your faithfulness then, it speaks, you shall establish in the very heavens. So it's plural, heavens, Shemayim. And what that means is, for example, when you look outside, you walk outside here, you can see the arc of the sky, you can see the atmosphere that's above the earth here. That's one level because Shemayim is dual. The second aspect of that is the rest of the heavens, the universe, where all the planets and all of that are out there the Milky Way and all that stuff. That's the rest of it. So he's the Lord over all of that. Look what it says in verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen, and I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So what he does is he reinforces here his promise, the Davidic covenant. He gave the promise to David that his ancestor would be the Messiah and he would sit on his throne someday. 
Folks, we're going into the Christmas season, right? Uh, here we are. It's, uh, wow, first part of November. Before you know it, we'll be there. And, of course, we start integrating some uh, music relating to that. In fact, the song after this is a song that kind of ties some of this together. But here's the reality, folks. Yeshua, Jesus, is Messiah. He's God in the flesh. And when you think about the Davidic covenant, think about passages like Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, right? And it says in verse 6 that unto us a child is born and a son is given. The child is his humanity. The son is his deity. For the son of God came, right? And his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And so he's not the father. The father and the son are not the same, right? They're co-equal in essence, power, and authority, right? But they have unique roles within the Godhead. But here's the reality when it says the everlasting Father. He's the source. That's what it means of salvation and redemption. But it says in verse 7 that the government will rest upon his shoulders and he would sit on the throne of his ancestor David because there's that direct lineage. So has he come as Messiah and the suffering servant? Yes, we're seeing his ministry now. But has he come back to establish his kingdom yet and his throne? Has he sat on the throne of his ancestor David in Jerusalem yet? No. That prophecy is yet to be fulfilled because he literally will come someday and establish his throne. He will sit on his throne and he'll rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years during the millennial reign. Isn't that amazing? So you see those promises and God is faithful. He promised the Jewish people. He promised David he would be faithful. And you know what? He's faithful to all who will trust him. He's faithful to us when we trust him. Even when the storms rage and the challenges are there and we wonder why. God uses those things to deepen our faith. And by the way, the big picture, the eternal perspective is what matters more to God than anything else because, again, our life here is a vapor. It's just a dot compared to forever, right? But what we do in this life, the way we handle things, the, the stewardship and the management of our life and our relationship with God has eternal consequences. Look what it says in verse 5. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, O Yahweh, right? So when it says heavens, all of creation speaks of the Creator, it glorifies Him. And, and we know the heavens are vast. In David's day, it says in Psalm 8 that he looked up at the night sky and he said, Who is man, God, that you are mindful of, of him, of me? He was blown away. He could tell this is a way beyond my pay grade. And you created the entire universe, God. You spoke it into existence, and yet you love me so personally. If he could have known what you and I know now with technological advancements, how vast our galaxy is alone, let alone the universe, and there are billions of planets and stars and stuff, and God created them power of his word. That's overwhelming. That's awesome, right? The very creation glorifies and honors him. Verse 6, for who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Well, obviously no one, rhetorical. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? No, there's no comparison. None is like the Lord. God is greatly to be feared in all the assembly of the saints. Reverence and awe, right? Folks, if you don't have a sense of reverence and awe for God on a regular basis, then you don't have a right understanding of who he really is and how awesome he is. Again, God is the one who said, let there be, and he created. He's awesome beyond our comprehension. In the person of Jesus, he humbled himself to become like us, to become one of us, to die on our behalf, right? To be a substitute in our place so that we can have eternal life. And when we really start to understand and grasp how amazing and awesome he is, how great he is, there's no one to even compare to him and yet he loves us so personally and so intimately. It's beyond our comprehension. You should be in awe of that. And by the way, if we disregard how awesome God is, and we always like to focus on that he's a God of love, yes. In fact, in John and his epistles, he said that God is love. That's one of his attributes, right? He's the ultimate manifestation of agape, selfless and sacrificial love. So we like to focus on that, but all of his attributes are equal. He's also just and holy and a judge, and he's righteous. And if we don't understand that, you better be a, your papa can take you behind the woodshed for a whipping. Read Hebrews 12. God scourges those that he loves. If you don't listen to a rebuke, he'll dial it up a little bit. If he's trying to get your, your attention as a child of God, you don't listen, then he'll dial up the heat a little bit. And finally, if you need it, the word in the, in the Greek is scourged, whipped. It's the same word they applied when they scourged Jesus. You know, God doesn't want us to, he doesn't want to have to, uh, you know, discipline us, but God, he tells he chastens those he loves. And even Hebrews 12 says that that verifies that we're really his kids, right? That we have become children of God. So, wow, we should be in awe of the Lord because he's awesome. 
So God is greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. By the way, that word saint, when you see that, right? Some people think, well, the New Testament says saint. The word in Hebrew is kadosh, okay? In Greek, it's hagios. It means holy, separated. God separates us. All who believe in the Lord and place their faith and trust in him, we become saints. That's what the words mean, separated, holy. It's by virtue of what he's done and the application of his righteousness to us. Look at verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Again, the rhetorical question. Your faithfulness also surrounds you. So again, think of God's faithfulness, that he is faithful to his people. And then there's verse 9 again. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still, you still them. So let's go back to Matthew 8. What do we see? Jesus stands and he says to the disciples, why are you fearful? Oh, you little faith. You imagine them standing around going, why are we fearful? The boat's taking on water. It's filling up. We're going to drown. And you're just like, right? So he was helping them come to a place of deeper uh, faith and trust. And he's the one who calmed the winds and the sea. And I just wanted to point that out to you again about God's faithfulness. And continuing through this today, I'm going to point out some things about the encounter with these two guys, the demoniacs. But then we're going to go into some issues relating to spiritual warfare as well. And think about God's faithfulness with people today to help us navigate in the season of spiritual warfare. Because here's the reality. <clears throat> We've talked about it. It seems like the last six months or so, uh, spiritual warfare has been intense it's been ramped up, right? Now, there are those who blame every negative thing that happens. And I'm not saying in our church, but just some people, even Christians, will say every negative thing. That's the devil. That's the devil doing that. No, sometimes things happen, people. <laughs> we live in a fallen world. Things happen. There are other people on the other end of the spectrum who don't give any credence to spiritual warfare and to a demonic realm or angelic realm, right? There is a balance because it's real, <laughs> okay? But God is faithful, and he's provided what we need. Now, look at what happens in this encounter. And when he, Jesus, had come to the other side, they finished their boat trip. They make it to the other side of the Galilee, on the southeast side, to the country of the Gergesenes. And there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. Now, in Matthew, or in Mark and Luke's accounts, it gives some more detail about this. These guys were, wow, you could only imagine what they might have looked at, they were, they, were, they, were, they were like wild animals. They literally were possessed by demonic spirits. And you know what? In this day and age, probably in our country, in our community, you don't see much of that. In, in 23 years of pastoral ministry, I've seen some unique things. <laughs> uh, had some unique encounters with people who were involved in Satanism and stuff. And hey, they had given themselves over to demonic influence and uh, you see some pretty interesting things, but I've also seen the power of God send the demonic presence in those people fleeing because of God's presence. The enemy can't stand in the presence of the Lord. Amen? So here's the reality. This was a real deal. These guys come out. They're a mess. They're running around. They've been living in the tombs. They're naked. Their bodies are cut to shreds. They apparently had been cutting themselves. By the way, you hear about that a lot today, right? Especially young people cutting themselves for whatever the stress, whatever they're going through. Let me tell you something. That's not God compelling people to do that. And my heart breaks for people when they're hurting and going through stuff. But when you get to a place that you're harming yourself physically, those, that's a demonic presence trying to get you to hurt yourself. You've crossed a line. So be praying. If you know anybody that's in that situation, pray for them and try to help them out because I do know that there are some young people who go through things and they wind up doing that. He see, the enemy, guys, he's all about stealing, killing, and destroying. No good at all, right? But Jesus came to give life and abundance in that life by depth of relationship with him. And so if you know anybody that's like that, these guys, they hurt themselves. They had strength beyond comprehension. These guys, they tried to chain them before they could break the chains. I mean, these guys were off the charts. And again, it wasn't because of them. It was because of the demonic presences that literally were in them, had possessed them because they did not know the Lord. They obviously didn't know the Lord. They wouldn't be possessed. But remember in the area, folks, there were a group, there were, there were not only Jewish people who lived in the Galilee, Galilee the Galil, but also there were the Decapolis, the 10 uh, cities and, uh, that were Gentile. There were a lot of different people groups living in the area. So these guys had apparently been involved in some occult activity. They had done something to open themselves up to demonic possession. So guess what? You, you in your own strength, no person could have dealt with them, and the locals could not deal with them. 
And yet they ran around the tombs where people were being buried. That's where they lived. They came out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. People were afraid. I think you'd probably be freaked out a little bit too if those guys came flying out there, right? Unless you knew the Lord, right? And you don't want to go looking for trouble unless God provides a divine appointment. He's going to use you. Look at verse 29. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus you son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? Those demonic presences, they knew exactly who Jesus was, right? Do you remember on the boat just, you know, before this when we studied that, that after Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples who'd been walking with him said, who is this? What kind of person is this that can do this? They were asking, and yet the demons knew. They had no doubt. Why? Because they knew that Jesus is God in the flesh. They expressed that, you son of God. And so they recognized that. They made a proclamation of that reality. But you know what? They're, they're not redeemable. Demons are angels who fell, rejected God. When Satan fell and he rejected God, he wanted to be like the Most High, Isaiah 14. Nope, there's only one and you ain't going to be one. But you know what? He was so influential, he was able to convince a third of the other angels who had worshipped the very presence of God to rebel as well. That's staggering to me. You talk about influence. You don't think the enemy's still very influential today? And remember, he doesn't show up at your doorstep, you know, with his head spinning around going, "Ah, follow me. No, he is created as an angel of light. You read Ezekiel 28, it talks about how beautiful he is. And he still retains that beauty, but he deceives through that beauty as well. Who's going to follow, you know, this crazy creature, right? But he himself comes in a beautiful sense. These guys, however, were ridden by these these demons who were controlling them in a way, but they knew who Jesus was. Verse 30, it says, Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And it's interesting because we see in God's word that these demonic presences, they desire to inhabit uh, people, or entities, right? Something flesh and living. So they didn't, they didn't say, well, you can't do anything to us, Jesus. They said, so if you're going to do this or if our time has come, by the way, there's an understanding when they say, have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew that they had judgment that was coming. They knew that ultimately Jesus did have that authority. Though they would not submit to it, they recognized who he was and they were wondering, is this our time of judgment? There will be a time coming. So he said, if you're going to cast us out, send us into the pigs. And look what Jesus says in verse 32. Did he have this big debate? Did he get into this huge back and forth with these guys? No. He said to them, go. Talk about authority. Talk about power, right? Now remember again, there's the disciples and those who had actually watched Jesus healing people in Capernaum. Jesus calmed the storm and now at his command, These guys who are possessed by these demons, they're set free. And the demons are sent into the swine, these pigs. By the way, pigs are unclean, right, in Jewish culture for one thing. So these might have been Gentiles, obviously, who were part of this, but but maybe they were Jews who were disobedient as well. And suddenly, what happens? After he said, go. So when they came out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea, and perished in the water. And it's really interesting. When you're on the Sea of Galilee and you're going around, you go to the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee, there's only one place, there's only one cliff at Gadara that is just like this, where that could have happened. And that's probably exactly where it happened, right? So it's pretty amazing. So look what happens then. Verse 33, Then those who kept them, so the guys who were herding the pigs, they watched well, what, what's going on? All of our pigs went and drowned themselves. They're freaking out. They saw Jesus do this. And they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon possessed man. So can you imagine the report to all the people? And these guys are going, what? Well, we got to go check this out. So everybody says, we're going to go check. This is fantastic. we got to go check this out. So not fantastic, and that's a good thing. Just probably this is beyond, wow, you got to be kidding me. So they go out, and when they come, look what we find in verse 34. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they celebrated, and they praised him, they acknowledged him as Messiah. Nah, <laughs> that's not what it says. Now, you would think, right, 
that anybody who understands that he is Messiah, they see what he does, their response would be, wow, only, only the Messiah could do something like this. No, what is their response? It's self-centered. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Wow. Instead of saying, wow, look, he's got the power to set people free, to meet people where they're at. And, and they didn't celebrate the fact that these poor guys who had been possessed by these demons for, for who knows how long were now set free from that. They were thinking about, wow, you're, you're just stirring things up around here, Jesus. You're no good for business. By the way, you know, you know how much those pigs are worth? Probably some of the people had invested in those pigs, and they're thinking, we just lost our money. You know, get out of here. Go away. Isn't that sad? How many people respond that way to Jesus even today, right? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He laid his life down. He shed his blood on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Third day, he was raised from the dead, alive forevermore. New covenant is in place. And yet the vast majority of people, when the gospel is presented to them, when they hear of the love of Jesus and what he's done for them, no thanks. Jesus, nah, go away. I want to live life on my own terms. You know, I got this, whether it's religion and I've got this, I can get it done myself. You know, we're saved by grace through faith, that ourselves a gift of God, not of works, lest you boast, right? That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, verse 10 says, for by for we're his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works he prepared in advance. The good works come as a result of the salvation. They're not a means to get saved. If you're truly born again and you know God, you have a relationship with him, then the works that we do glorify and honor him because we're his heart and his hands and his feet. But how many people, again, say, no, I, I, no, I want to live for myself. I want to live life on my own terms. You know, I don't really want to follow Jesus. That still happens today because some way, somehow, it's going to, tax on their gig, <laughs> so to speak, right? That's got to be something back from the 90s or 80s, right? Some of you guys are old like me. I don't know if you remember that stuff. <laughs> but here's the reality. The power and authority of Jesus over the waves. We've seen him healing, right? He healed all these people. He commands the waves to be still. We went back to Psalm 89. And here, in his authority and power over the demonic realm, he exercises that. And even the demonic realm understands that reality. So folks, I want you to take a little time today uh, going to Ephesians chapter 6. We talked about uh, spiritual warfare and some of the things that some people have been experiencing. So we're going to go to Ephesians and we have the classic passages here in Ephesians on the full armor of God, right? I want to spend a little bit of time here. Again, in light of the fact that spiritual warfare has been intensified. And I, I touched on that a little bit earlier that, uh, again, you can go through seasons where things are great and all of a sudden it's obvious that something's happening. Uh, I was at a pastor's conference a month ago and all the pastors that I talked to from the region and other places, and I've heard it from others around the country as well, that it's obvious that there has been uh, a rise in spiritual warfare, that the enemy's uh, magnifying his, his spiritual warfare. And God, though, has given us resources, right? And we need to understand that we can walk in these. We find in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, and these are, again, the classic passages on spiritual warfare. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, finally, or relating to these last things that he's communicating to the church at Ephesus, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And there's a period. Wow. Wow. He didn't give this whole list of things to place our faith and trust in or to be strong in. It's not in something, it's in a who. And it's in the Lord himself, right? That's our source. He's our source. So when he says, finally, my brethren, be strong, that's the word in the Greek language talks being, speaks to being continually empowered, be continually empowered by God because he's the source of our strength. Be strong in the Lord. Remember, kurios, the Greek word for Lord here is the equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh. So, right, he is a self-existent one. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Remember, he's the one who did what he spoke and created. What? Stretched out Shemayim, the heavens. It was at his word, his command. He spoke creation into existence. And yet he's right here willing to and wanting to extend his power in our lives so we can navigate life, right? Right? this side of eternity, because we're going to have some challenges. And he says this in verse 11, put on the whole armor, and it doesn't say of Phil or Bob or Bill, right? No, it's of God. 
It's the full armor of God. God presents armor for us. And of course, we know historically, the reference would have been to like what a Roman soldier wears. Paul was very familiar with that. He wound up being chained to Roman soldiers continually for two years when he was in house arrest. He, he saw how they dressed. And of course, in that culture, with the Romans being an authority over most of the jurisdictions in that area, they saw the Roman soldiers continually. So there's a wonderful application with that armor. So it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And wiles means strategies. The enemy has strategies that he tries to employ as it relates to spiritual warfare. We know in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, it says, you know, that our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's saying, if they're not fleshly, they're not of this world. It's spiritual in nature, and that's what he's communicating here. But he uses the parallel of a Roman soldier and what they wear so they would understand the aspects of the armor that they would put on. Because the enemy does implement strategies, and he's very good at it, and he knows just what our weaknesses are. And by the way, remember this. How many times, maybe you've said it before, you're going through a rough stretch, you feel like there's spiritual warfare, or so you've heard somebody say it, man, Satan's really giving me a bad time. <laughs> or Satan's coming after me you know what? No, he's not. Yeah, there could be some demonic things, but, but Satan is a created entity. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. He's got a lot bigger fish to fry than you and I. He himself, he's more likely, I'm sure, in the Middle East, he probably stays pretty close to Israel and the Temple Mount and that particular area, right? But he's not here, but there is a demonic realm. And look what it says as we move forward. For we do not wrestle. Our battle, right, is not against flesh and blood, against people. He's talking again about the supernatural realm. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He just defined demonic realm. And it's just like an army. Again, there are different uh, categories in the demonic realm, just like in the angelic realm, cherubim, seraphim, there are various angels within that. And so there is also, and it's highly organized, Make no mistake that Satan himself is the upper guy. He is the general, but underneath him, right, there's the demonic hosts. And make no mistake, for every community and everywhere you go, there is a demonic reality, even in our community. Folks, if we could see beyond this four-dimensional experience that we have, again, scientists have discovered 10 or 11 dimensions, and God created them all. If we could see in the dimension and realm where you could see angels and you could see demons, it would freak you out probably, Right? But greater is he, Jesus Christ, who is us, and us than he that's in the world. Because we can't stand against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in our own strength because we don't have it. It's Christ in us, right? It's Jesus in us. It's the Lord and his mighty power that we stand on. So as he says, here's the reality. There are schemes and strategies that the enemy tries to implement. And when you personalize that, know this that the enemy knows your strengths and your weaknesses and he knows mine. And they know just the buttons to push and just how to set us up in our vulnerabilities. And the enemy doesn't play by any rules. So why give him any ground, right? Because the enemy's trying to trip us up. The spiritual warfare is real, They're trying to freak anybody out. But if you just kind of think, oh, this is, this is a fairy tale, this isn't real. Well, you, you fall and prey to a deception already by the enemy. But don't get freaked out and, and don't be paranoid either, right? Because when we're strong in the Lord and his mighty power, there's no need to be. There's no need to be. So what do we do? He says in verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole, the complete armor, again, of God. It's God's armor that he gives to us, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You stand your ground. You put on the full armor and you stand your ground in the power of God. Because that's what the enemy wants us to do is to give up ground. He wants us to give in. Something we've talked about with the understanding and, uh, and the reality that a lot of people have been experiencing heightened spiritual warfare, right? Two of his main strategies that seem rather amb ambiguous, but you know what? They're very, very successful. Discouragement and feeling overwhelmed. And when you feel discouraged and overwhelmed, guess what? You feel like you're trying to run in peanut butter, right? That'd be really tough. It's hard enough in a swimming pool, right? That's good exercise in the water, but you're trying to trudge through the mud or peanut butter, and you just feel like giving up. 
They're very subtle, but they're very effective. And a lot of people experience that. Those are some of the entry-level strategies of the enemy. But when we put on the full armor, knowing the enemy wants to implement these things, we have discernment and understanding, wow, wait a minute, this is not just normal. You can sense it. You can feel an overwhelming sense of discouragement. Then you go before the Lord because in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy, right? And God gives us what we need. So he says, look, being able to withstand in the evil day, well, you know what? It was, it was not good then. It's not good now. Look at the world we live in. There's so much prophecy having been fulfilled relating to the last days. Israel being gathered as a nation, that is a key prophecy to the last days to know where we're at. But look at culture, look at society, look what's going on in the Middle East. I'll be doing a prophecy update soon. And we see the situation in Syria with uh, Iran and Turkey and Russia in place in their backyard, right? And those are three major players in Ezekiel 38. Wow. I mean, there's so much going on. But look at our country, an election coming up on Tuesday. Look at the divide and the vitriol that exists even in our own country. You know, it's pretty wild what's going on. And uh, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. But Jesus is the answer. But God told us that in the last days, things would get worse. Culturally, the divides, all those things would get worse. So he says in verse 14, stand Therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So when you think about the Roman soldier, and some of us, all of us who were football players, right? Especially if, oh, some of us who were older, we did have to wear what they called a girdle. <laughs> some of the newer, it's totally different. You guys, you guys got this updated stuff today you get to wear. Man, I wish we had all that. Okay, so we, we did, did we? That's probably why I had all those concussions and stuff. If they did, if they did an MRI on my melon, wow. And who knows what they, explain a lot, right? <laughs> So the belt, the Roman soldiers would put a belt on around a tunic. And of course, then they would hang their sword off of that, everything else. And when they did a battle, by the way, they didn't have the tunics. They could take, if they needed to move quickly, they would take their tunics, they would roll it up, and they would stuff it down the belt, freeing up their legs to run or to move quickly like they needed to. But look what he says. And as we go through the full armor here as quick as possible, I just thought we're going to be able to break this down a lot. But think about Jesus too, because he embodies all that we see here. So we put on, we gird about our waist, truth, the belt of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? He said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So put on Jesus. Paul says that in Colossians, that we should clothe ourselves with Christ. And when we die to self, when we put on Jesus, then we're able to extend the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, thoughtfulness, self-control that can only come because of Him being in control of our lives and through the Holy Spirit giving us what we need. So we put on the belt of truth. And not only does it speak of Jesus, but folks, that talks about us being serious about living in the truth of God and, and not treating it like something, again, like medication. Consistency, consistently walking in God's truths. You know what? That's a pretty good anecdote against the enemy and his attacks, right? If we're not spending the time in the word of truth, God's word, as we need to be, are we prepared when the onslaught of the enemy comes? No, you usually get your butt kicked, right? So he's saying here, good about your loins, belt of truth, and that kind of centers everything. Then having put on the breastplate of righteousness, if you've seen the Roman armor, it goes all the way around the neck, front and back, all the way down to the waist to protect everything that's in here. So it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Well, guess what? Jesus is our righteousness. One of the Hebrew names for the Lord is Yahweh Sikainu, and it means the Lord our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Second Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, guess what? His righteousness is imputed to us, given to us, and we're covered by that righteousness that the Father sees as pure and holy because of the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. Isn't that amazing? So we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're reminded that we have the righteousness of God, but also, folks, to be effective as it relates practically in the area of spiritual warfare. We need to be living in the truth and living the right way. If we're living like idiots and we're, we're playing a religious game and, you know, we're just kind of, okay, I'm a Sunday Christian and then I go do this and that and then we wonder why we struggle. Duh! It's a no-brainer. Consi it's hard enough sometimes, but consistency in the Lord and that's what he's talking about. Live the right way. 
And we can only do that because we're in the truth, right? And we're consistently in the truth. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does Jesus do? When we accepted Jesus, we heard the gospel, we experienced his peace. He is also Yahweh Shalom, the Lord of peace, right? So we experience peace, and even with the warfare, it can be an intense situation that because he's the prince of peace, we can experience peace. It passes all understanding. Why? Because our eyes are focused on him, because we're walking in the truth. And another aspect of that is, is that those feet of the Roman soldiers, their sandals had nails, long nails on the bottom of them. And what that allowed them to do is when they were in hand, hand combat or close and close combat, they would be able to dig in. Having done all the stand, they would stand, and they would not be moved. And so these guys were like Navy SEALs of their day. Roman soldiers were really good at what they did. They would take what's called a makarios. It's like a 24-inch blade, and they would have their big shield. We're going to see that in a second. And in hand-to-hand, in close combat, man, they were really good at that. So they would dig in with their feet, and that's what God is saying, that we need to dig in with our feet and stand, right? But also as we are walking this walk with the Lord, that we're willing also to share the gospel of peace with those that we encounter, right? The Lord wants us to be his heart and his hands and his feet. Heart is first. Because when we love the Lord and we're committed to him, we say, Jesus, here I am, then he gives us his heart to love those around us that are hurting and dying and need to know him. Then we can effectively be his hands and his feet. So there's those two aspects of it. Above all, verse 16, interesting, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So, wow, what do, we, what do we see already in our study this morning about Jesus saying, oh, you have little faith, <laughs> right? Faith is critical, and God wants to stretch our faith so we're truly walking in faith. And it says here that if we take up the shield of faith, there's the possibility of quenching all the fiery darts. Would God have said that if it's not possible? Now, here's the reality. Sometimes some darts get in there, right? Sometimes we let the shield down. Some challenges the side of heaven, but the possibility is there, and God wants to stretch your faith. For the Roman soldiers, they, most of them carried shields that were about four feet long and about two and a half feet wide, and they were covered with leather and sometime other material. And so what they would be able to do when somebody did shoot fiery darts at them, and it was common for them if they had access to it to dip their shields in water so that when the enemy was shooting flaming arrows at them, it would stick in their shields and it wouldn't get them. And then they would be extinguished too, perhaps, because of their, their shields being wet, because the material was on that. And so there was a practical thing that the people could say, yeah, I get that. And folks, the, the fiery darts are all those things that the enemy tries to shoot at you and me, especially in our weaknesses. Temptation, discouragement, feeling overwhelmed, all those things that would remove us from our simple faith and trust in the Lord and our walk with him. Because that's what the enemy wants, is to get God's people to give up and to walk away and not truly live for the Lord. Because it's the a Christian who's effective is a Christian who's abiding. And that's the person that also says, I want to be your heart and your hands and your feet. I want to go out into the world and be used of you to make a difference. Right? So the enemy wants to hinder that. So quickly, we find this then. And take then the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So when you're born again, right, redeemed, we have a helmet of salvation, and it protects our heads. What's inside of your head? Your brain, your mind also, right? Remember, we are triune in our makeup. We're a spirit that's immaterial. We have a soul. That's our mind, intellect, ability, emotions, right? Ability to think and reason. And we live in a physical body, three in one, right? So the battle is in our mind. And so put on the helmet of salvation. We've been redeemed, but also, Lord, save me from me. (laughs) You heard me pray that earlier. I pray that all the time, Lord. Sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. God, save me from my weaknesses. Save me from these things. And that's not salvific. That's not redemption. That's practical as we live this life, right? But one of the things, and I'm not adding to God's word here, but you know what an exercise that I do when I put on the armor of God when I'm praying? I say, Lord, and give me the mind of Christ. We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the final verse says that as Christians, we have the mind of Christ. And I'll pray, Father, please give me, that may my mind, my thought processes, my actions, my reactions, my attitudes, all these may they be Christ-like. And when Paul said in Romans 12, 2, right, do not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Our minds are transformed by the washing of the water of the word, Ephesians 5, by the word of God. We have to have a continually having the word of God in our hearts and our minds. So put on the mind of Christ too. And then we take the sword of the spirit, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is called the sword of the spirit. It's living and powerful. 
The word of God is living and powerful, and it transforms our lives, amen? How cool is that? So we need to be consistently taking the sword of the Spirit, using it in our own personal lives, but applying those truths as it relates to spiritual warfare. And then he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication, not only going before the Lord, making requests on your own behalf, but making intercession for others as well. Worshiping, going before the Lord, and spending that time with him. Making supplication in the Spirit. What does that mean? It means by the power of the Spirit of God that you take it seriously, that it's not some frivolous, oh, dear Lord, you know. Yeah, these guys are really hurt and please help them. No, it's honest, concentrated, faith-filled, I believe, Lord, and I trust your word and I trust you and I'm gonna press into you. I'm gonna seek you. I'm gonna seek and keep seeking. I'm gonna knock and I'm gonna keep knocking, right? I'm gonna ask and I'm gonna keep asking. Jesus said we should do that, right? Right? We saw that earlier in Matthew. So consistency before the Lord, making prayer by the empowerment and the leading of the Holy Spirit, and our prayer should always be that we would pray according to God's will. Nothing more and nothing less. That's so, so critical. And then Paul says this to conclude, and I'm going to have Jabin come up. We'll sing a couple more worship songs. So Paul says this, by the way, that we should be praying, right, in all perseverance and for all the saints. We should be praying for each other. And I hope you pray for others. You hear us Sunday mornings, we pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the body of Christ in Vernal in this country and around the world. We should always be praying for other believers. And then Paul said this, and for me, Paul said expressly that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He said, please pray for me that I will not shrink back, but I will boldly communicate the reality of God's love and what Jesus has done. And when he says the mystery of the gospel, until... The church age came into existence till Messiah came to proclaim what that looked like, what his kingdom looked like. Uh, you know, he said he came to the Jew first and the Gentile. And the mystery of the gospel is that God came to bring peace and reconciliation to himself through his son Jesus by virtue of his sacrifice, his death and his resurrection, the shedding of his blood for our sins. And that blew people away. That was a mysterious thing that didn't make sense to the Jew. It was like, What? And then to the Gentiles, the Greek minded, they thought, that's just dumb that he died. But that just doesn't make sense. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It was a stumbling block. It just didn't make sense to them. It was foolishness. But we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. Right? Because it's that message. It's not the cross itself. It's the fact that Jesus died. That was the cruel order of the cross that he died for us, but he was raised from the dead. And man, is there power in that reality, amen? So he just wants us to walk in that, and he wants us to know that we can share the gospel and, the, uh, and bring clarity to this mystery that God loves us. And you don't have to be Jew or Gentile because that was part of the mystery too, that all who call in the name of Jesus, that is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, bond nor free, doesn't matter where you came from, all who place their faith in Jesus become part of the body of Christ. And that's a spiritual entity. It's not an organization, it's an organism. It's a spiritual reality that all of us, whether you live in China, you live in Iran, you live in rural America, if you know who Jesus Christ is and you place your faith and trust in him, and ask for forgiveness of sins, and you've been born again, become a child of God according to God's word, you become part of that body. Isn't that amazing? And that's a mystery to people. It blows them away. But that word mysterion means that it's something that God reveals at the appointed time, and then he brings clarity to that. And it was blowing people away, and Paul said, Pray that I have the courage to boldly proclaim that truth. And may that be the case for us too, right? That we'd put on the full armor of God, that we would come to him with all of our uniquenesses, all of our challenges. He knows it all anyway. And say, Lord, here I am. Help me to seek you. Help me to go deeper with you. Help me to truly walk in you. And by the way, as we go into a time of prayer and some more worship here, that passage that we began in Ephesians 6, you should hide this verse in your heart. It's a simple passage. But what did Paul say? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power or in the power of his might. Depending on your translation, same thing. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you, Lord. God, we thank you for your faithfulness and as we come to a time of uh, just being able to seek your face through worship and to praise you once again with these final songs, Lord. Just, just meet us here. In this moment of quietness, Father, before we Lift our voices in adoration again. God, just speak to our hearts with our eyes closed and our hearts open. Holy Spirit, just direct our time. And Jesus, we're so thankful that you, that the word proclaims as the king of kings, humbled yourself to become like us, took upon flesh. 
for the purpose of giving your life as a perfect sacrifice in our place. And we can never thank you enough for your love and what you've done. So Lord, we sing your praises. And again, just minister to our hearts right now before we lift up your name in worship and adoration. that will stand forever the angels sing glory, glory, hallelujah the light, the light has come the light, 
the light has come. Jesus, we just give you praise and glory. Thank you for this time of worship, Jesus. And uh, thank you that your mercies are new every day. And that uh, we stumble, we fall, we make mistakes, Lord. We don't listen to you, Lord. We rebel. But Lord, thank you for always forgiving us and just uh, not letting us go astray and always bringing us back into the fold, Lord. And Jesus, help us just to trust in you and walk with you, Lord. And thank you for dying on the cross and forgiving us of all of our sins, Lord, and reconciling us with you. Thank you for that relationship that we have with you, Lord Jesus. That we can just come to you anytime with any prayer and uh, just uh, help us not to take that relationship for granted, Lord, that we, we can just come before your throne anytime we want to. So we thank you for that, Jesus, and just be with us now as we sing this final song about you, Lord, and just give you praise for who you are because there's no one else that's like you in your name.
privilege we've had today just to spend this time with you and with each other, God, in fellowship. Just remind us, Lord, that you are our source, that we would be strong in you and in your mighty power, Lord, that you equip us through your grace as well. You give us the empowerment we need to live for you, and Lord, through your Holy Spirit. So just help us to seek you continually, Lord. Help us to be faithful in our walk with you, all for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. As he shines upon you, let him shine in and through and out of you so that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world.